Good evening. Well, I think the, uh, the record finished just nicely. I don't know if you, you knew where the sounds of music were coming from. Um, but over here, we have two... I mean, yes, the audience here is, is probably... Most of us are old enough to remember vinyl. Um, so it, we have a, a couple of, of school records which were made back uh, when Sam's, Stavanger American School, was in place. So the music that you were listening to at the, uh, as we came in with, with two albums, and at the time they used to have on, on one side was the choir and the other side was the band. So uh, we might even be able to get these electronically mastered and perhaps get them uh, re-engineered and, and, and for sale out. But uh, it's, I thought it was just a nice way to, to start this evening. Um, just a, remember, uh, a reminder that we're not planning any emergency uh, exercises or fire drills or anything tonight. So if, if the alarms go off, uh, then it is uh, not a pra practice that we've planned. The exits are at the back there where you came in, the two sides here, and actually back behind the, the stage as well. So I'll just close uh, the, the door here before, before we start. Well, it was last year back when we were thinking about, as we move into our 50th year, about the different types of events that we could do. And, and one of the things we talked about was an opening assembly for the students in school here with all, all our students we had them all in the gym, all 650 of them in the gym uh, at the beginning, first, first, first week of school. It was just so nice to see the, all the little ones all the way through to the big ones uh, actually seeing each other in one building. Uh, but the first major event that we have as, a, as, a, as an evening event, as an open event, is, is this evening. And so I'd like to welcome you, really, this evening to uh, our first um, uh, open evening event. Uh, I think tonight we're going on a little bit of a, of a journey uh, through the history uh, of ISS, um, and we're going through a little bit of a journey of the history of Stavanger. We're going through a little bit of a journey of the history of the oil industry. We're going through a little bit of a journey of geopolitical journey. Uh, and we have some speakers you see in your program, which we'll introduce as we, as we go through a little bit this evening. We then will have an intermission, and we have cake, and we have some, some canapes and uh, some, some, some drinks. Uh, as you will know, in, in, uh, in Norway, we're not allowed to serve alcohol in a school building, so they're all soft drinks that, that we'll have this evening. Um, and then afterwards, we, we're mixing it up a little bit. We're doing something a little bit different. We're putting some people under pressure, and they have to give uh, five-minute presentations using a maximum of ten slides, and they can't control the clicker that I'm doing. So that will be a little bit of a, bit of a mix-up in the second half, a bit more traditional first half and a bit of a, a mix-up in, in, the, in the second half. We're actually not the, the only people who are celebrating uh, 50 years. It's funny when you get to the 50th year that you, you start to, to see other things that you wouldn't have seen before. And, and people, people keep on handing me things, uh, like the Sigmund uh, candy here. And apparently the, the original goldfish, it's there 50 years in Norway for the original goldfish. No, you can't have them, they're mine. They're mine. But, but you, keep, you keep seeing things like that as, as you get into to, to the, to the 50th. But I, I guess the, the history of um, the International School of Stavanger and, and Stavanger in, in, in general has been entwined with the uh, exploration uh, of oil in the Norwegian sector uh, of the North Sea since the 1960s. And it was back uh, at that time where several American oil companies established offices in, in, in Stavanger. And as you can see, if you uh, look at the picture there behind me, um, things have changed a little bit, I think, since, uh, since that photograph was taken. You'll see opposite the, the church there on the top of the hill, which still sits proudly, just across there was the old uh, Revheim School building, um, where... Uh, a new building was built for Revheim, for Revheim School. And as that finished, uh, on the 15th of September 1966, we had the ability that Sams were able to move into uh, that old Revheim School building. Um, there were uh, 42 American students, aged 6 to 17. There were four teachers there and a director. Um, the original building that you see there, which was then knocked down about a year or so later, was actually built in, in 1891. Um, and you can see in the background is actually where you're seated now, which I understand is the, the Revheims Mure or the, the, the Revheims Bog. We're on the bog land here in, in, in the background. And as you look back in the, in the distance, you won't see the amphi or anything like that. In fact, you don't see too many, too many houses uh, back in, in, in that area. And we see how things ha have changed there. 
So initially, the, the SAMS was allowed to, to have three classes in the old building. That was what it started. There was a director's office. Um, there was no desk, actually, in the director's office. There was, the, there was all, all the furniture that was left behind from the old school, but there was no, di no uh, uh, faculty or staff furniture. And so a number of the oil companies actually at that time donated uh, desks. There's one actually still, the one that Linda used in her office. We've now moved into the boardroom, and that will stay there. It's the first desk which was donated to, uh, by an oil company, and we were supposed to hand it back to them when we actually were able to have our own uh, uh, equipment and desks there. But, uh, so if they could do come and claim it, we will, of course, return it to, to them. Uh, the school was allowed also to use uh, some of the more modern facilities in the new Revheim building, things like cookery, uh, science labs that were in there. Um, the newly built swimming pool was, it was a clear attraction. Uh, but also the, uh, the toilets, the new inside toilets were a big attraction. Rather than having to just walk across that little white building to the other white building uh, to, to go to, to the bathroom. We then saw that over the next couple of years that the school moved around quite a, a lot in, in, in Stavanger. It started off then, once it moved from uh, the old Revheim uh, school building, it moved to Egenes Schooler in 1968, then to Kvalberg Schooler in uh, 71 and 72, uh, to Newland Schooler then on, on 72 and 73, and then up to five locations. As the school grew, it had different people uh, and different things in different locations. And you're probably thinking, what on earth is that dentist doing up there in, in that building? And many of you who uh, are Stavanger locals will, will know who, uh, why that is there, is that the top floor of Newland Schooler was actually the main city dentist office. And it was where actually a lot of the, the dentistry was coordinated for, for school children or more complicated cases went to. And there seems to be a bit of a theme about dentists because we, when we moved to this building uh, here in, in 1982, there was also a little bit later through the years, there's one of the rooms here that also had a dentist's uh, surgery in there. So there's some underlying uh, teeth uh, a story that's, that's the theme that's going through uh, here as well. So then in 1982, we get to the campus where we are now, which in the old picture was where the, where the, the bog was. Uh, and originally when it started off, there were 70 classrooms that were, were ready to start. A wonderful support from uh, Stavanger Komuna in providing the, the grounds and, and uh, the, the land there. Uh, the company supported the, the build also through capital assessment fees and seat rights in order to, to get the school at the ground and pay for the, the, the buildings and the, the property. Uh, and over the years, the, the, the local communities have been incredibly supportive of the International School of Stavanger and, and then SAMS. And if Linda Duvel was here actually today, she would say that actually it's a model for many international schools and cities around the world about the relationship between uh, the school, the international school and the local communities and how that is supported in, in very much a, a, cooperative, a cooperative way. So if we're looking at the community, the things have, did change. I mean, we started off, as we said, with one nationality 42 Americans, four American teachers were, were here uh, at, the, at the original building. By 1990 to 1991, um, we'd moved up to about 25 different nationalities. And at that time, it was then decided that the school should really change its name to the International School of Stavanger because the original name that started and founded the school didn't fit with what the profile of the school was like anymore. It had changed. Even though you ask taxi drivers from the airport to go to the international school, they'll say, what do you mean the American school? No, it's the international school as far back as, as, as 1991 there. We can see that with further diversification, uh, diversification came along with, with NATO moving to uh, Stavanger from Oslo in 1995. And it's, I think it's particularly fitting that in our 50th year, we have 50 nationalities represented within our student body. And we can see really the, the change from 1 to 50, the, the diversity there. We can see that in reality, our biggest nationality is, is other yeah, within the context of school uh, in terms of the different uh, percentages and proportions we have. It, it, we've actually, in the little diagram there, included uh, double nationalities because we have so many of our, our kids uh, actually have two or three, three different passports that they hold. Programs and accreditations. The international school has always sought after quality, has always looked to external validation. 
has never thought that we think we are doing the right thing and, we, and we're good and we're happy with it. We've always gone outside to try to make sure that other people are, uh, put us under the review, that other organizations do that. And I think that's the sign of, of us being confident who we are, but also wanting to move forward. So we're one of a very few schools in the world that actually has been accredited by the Council of International Schools and New England Association of Schools and Colleges five, five times. We were the, one of the early adopters of the British GCSE examinations and A-levels initially back in 1986. And the first year that the IGCSE became available from the University of Cambridge, we moved to that. The A-levels were replaced by the International Baccalaureate Diploma Programme in 1996. In 2003, we started what was called the International School Assessments. They follow the PISA assessments that you see nationally in different, different locations. Uh, around about 1990 to 2000, the Dutch uh, came to the school year. The Dutch school joined with us. And uh, this, this year, we're, we're very proud and privileged to have the French Maternal program uh, coming here uh, at 2015, 2016, the preschool here at the International School of Stavanger. So we have a strong history in terms of innovation, development, seeking quality, but putting ourselves out to external scrutiny and ex ex external validation and benchmarking. A slight change of tack now, a little bit from the history of the school to a little bit about some of the things that have changed uh, over the years in, in education. At the beginning of Sam, gosh, who's that very handsome man there? Um, at the beginning of the year assembly, we talked to the kids about some of the changes and introduced them to vinyl records and things that had happened. But you can see that a lot of the relationships of things that have changed from yesterday to today, some of which are resources and facilities uh, related. Some of our former students and current students who look at this probably don't have a clue what the old desks in lines were like and the chalkboards and inkwells on desks and bander masters and these things. They just really didn't, you know, uh, they don't really, uh, are not really in contemporary education uh, as, as much now. I don't know whether many of you remember language labs. A good way to learn languages was to put headphones on and not talk to anybody around you at all. That was seen as being a, a really good way to, to learn a language. But so, so what we see now is this notion of, of, uh, of blended learning. You know, we, we, we don't see that we've thrown out all the old stuff and it's just new technology. Far from it, in fact. It's about using the books, the materials. It's about being hands-on. It's about making your own books in, in, a, in a concrete way and, and writing. But it's also about being able to use the technology to be able to do it and develop these things uh, through, through school also. You'll see in the broader sense, where if you look at changes in education worldwide, we, we see very much that the structure and content of education over the last 50 years has changed from perhaps a much more local or even school-based type programs to things like national curriculums, common core standards, uh, national standards, and, and international standards. We, we see that as, as a trend, as a change in, in education. We also see a movement away from traditional things like boys and girls subjects, home economics, needlework, woodshop, where, where, where people are segregated on the basis of, of gender, and much more reference to international and global issues. I think one of the major things that's perhaps changed uh, also has been this notion of the role of the teacher and the role of learning in, in schools. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the 1940s, 50s films, uh, Mr. Chips, of the role teacher, the fount of all knowledge, the sage on the stage, uh, imparting information and everybody listening with no real interaction. We see a, a much, ch much changed role of a teacher, a teacher who is a leader, a teacher who can be the sage on the stage, but a teacher who can facilitate, who can coach, who can empower, get students together, have them collaborate. So the focus has really changed on how students learn and the role of the teacher has changed along with that over the years. We see that in content with the relationship between the changing of facts or knowledge, understanding and skills. Much of what education uh, historically uh, has been about has been perhaps more emphasized on the knowledge basis. And as we've moved over the 50 years, we see a much greater emphasis in education, in, in understanding, in conceptual frameworks, in, in enduring skills. These have become much more prevalent uh, within our classrooms and in, within the delivery of, of education. And students, children have changed in some ways, or at least our expectations of them. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Yeah? The three wise children. Yeah? I think we've 
seen a, a massive change uh, in some of the things that we expect with children uh, around school. I had my um, admin team around for dinner at the end of the first couple of weeks of school to thank them for starting school off, and we thought, let's have a quick reminisce of the things that we, that we remember in school. And one of the things that they, they thought back to was discipline in particular. That is not a copy of, uh, not a picture of me on the, on the, the top uh, right-hand side there in former days with a moustache and a bit more hair. No, that's a, that's a headmaster with the, with the rule book of any beatings that you would have to write down in the book to make sure that it was registered. Um, you can see on the, on the side there a beating taking place, the slipper. Many of you might want to think, why is a board eraser there? Why is a board eraser there? Many of you know, I guess, Yes. Uh, the general knows exactly why that was there, because if the teacher didn't like things that you were doing, you would get a slap on the side of the face, probably from about 10 foot at least with the side of a board eraser. So we, we see that, that the things had, had changed. When we sat down for dinner as well, we said some random things had changed as well. Some of us remembered smoking benches in schools for the students. Faculty rooms that you couldn't get into because of the smoke that was coming out of the, of the, of the staff room. Um, uh, a couple of Belgian friends remembered uh, uh, some of our students who were sort of 15, 16, 17 were allowed to have tafel beer, table beer, uh, with, their, with their lunches. And on Friday, certainly one of the schools I worked with, we were allowed to drink as much wine as we possibly could within an hour uh, at lunch. <laughs> so you see a number of these, these things of progression in, in, in schools and things that have changed. There's probably not anybody over the age of about 25, I think, will be familiar with writing lines, I suspect, as one of the, the ways of, of control of, of students. But the irony is, I, I guess, as, as, we, as we move forward, really, in, in terms of this, um, that we, we, we look at these slides, and it was that kids shouldn't be seen, shouldn't be heard, shouldn't be listened to. And we get to an education actually now where students should be seen, should be heard, and should be listened to. The mission that we have in, in terms of school here is to inspire a community of responsible, globally engaged learners. How can you be a responsible, globally engaged learners if you don't participate in your learning, if you don't participate in your education? It's just an impossible thing to do. So as we look back at all these complexities that have changed in the, in, in, over time. And we perhaps, the students today are faced with a much more complex world than, they, than we were ever faced with. The irony is that the simplicity is actually the response to, to the complexity. It's what the mathematics, uh, mathematicians say. There's elegance in, 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 and beauty in the simplest solution. So really coming down to, in education, what we call you know, our value system. Coco Chanel, the famous fashion designer, says, fashion fades but style remains. In education, we talk about being true to our values, of what learning is about, what well-being is about, and what uh, community is about, and nurturing those. And those values were as pertinent as they were back in 1966, as they are today, and as they will be in 2066 and 2067. That's my introduction for this evening. Thank you. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Hans Ivan Ness. Um, Dr. Hans Ivan Ness graduated at the University of Oslo in 1970, uh, majored in history, received his Doctor of Philosophy in 1981, and is a prof and professor of history in 1995. He has authored more than 150 books and articles on the history of the courts, judicial procedures, crime, local government, local history, local cultural history in Stavanger and Rogaland, emigration history, social history, gender history. Hans Evan was the organizer of several archive institutions, including the city of Stavanger, Rogaland County. He was the executive board member of the International Council of Archives and senior advisor to the National Archivists until he retired in 2014. Additionally, Hans Evan has been the chairman of Stavanger City Historical Society, Old Stavanger Society, and the Stavanger City Library. He is still very active working on research with various projects. He has been a good friend to ISS over the years. His son, Hans Christian Ness, has been a long-standing member of staff here at the school and currently teaches history and is the curriculum coordinator for our social studies department. We really couldn't think of anyone better qualified and more experienced to speak this evening about the history of Stavanger. We would also like to thanks, uh, thanks, 
thank Hans Ivan for donating multiple copies of his book, Will and Vision, which you would have seen was available there in, in the foyer. And that is a generous gift to all of you this evening. So if you didn't pick one up on the way in, please make sure you pick one up before you leave this evening. We thank you very much for that generous donation. Would you please welcome Hans Ivan Ness. Thank you. Yes. Um, dear board members, dear Garrett, dear teachers, families and friends of ISS, I am honored for having been asked to extend a verbal congratulation on this event. Today is a day to pay tribute to ICS for the role this school, this Academy of Higher Education, has played in our city and for the Norwegian community during the past 50 years. This is a day for Stavanger and Rogelan to celebrate the importance you have had and will have for many decades ahead. And it's a day for you to celebrate your own endeavors and your own results. The establishment of an international school was not easy to foresee back in 1960. The school system at the time and the educational platforms were not based at least very much on progressiveness and innovation, even though processes had been initiated that was to alter this somewhat during the following years. In the gymnasium, mixed classes of boys and girls were still not normal when I myself graduated in 1962. After attending school for 12 years, I had never seen a female body in class, except for two teachers. For those who wanted to continue their academic lives attending universities, you had to leave Stavanger for Oslo or Bergen or go to England, Germany or the United States, which many did. An important change took place around 1960 when the gymnasium offering studies in economic disciplines was established. This quickly turned out to be popular and also gained increasing importance when Stavanger during the late 60s and 70s became the center of the international oil and gas industry. Later, IB was introduced, and this is, as I understand, a key curriculum at the ISS. Um, there are, though, some features of change that needs highlighting in this introduction. Stavanger, in post-war times, was a city of relative standstill, a city that had seen booms and crises following suit since the Middle Ages. Characteristics for the previous booms were that trade and industry exploited raw material to satisfy external demand. Timber in the 16th and 17th centuries, herring in the 19th century, and canning sardines in the 20th century. A bottom line during these centuries was that the need for shipping made for shipbuilding and ship repairs on a big scale. So whatever product was exported, Stavanger established and have always had and developed wide known competence on an excellence level in this industrial area. Repeatedly there turned out to be people in Stavanger that both had a will and a vision to find new platform for growth. This almost came to an end in during the first post-war decades. The discovery of oil in Norwegian territorial waters quickly brought industrialists and politicians to make Stavanger a center of the new industry, an industry at the time of unknown possibility and potential. To those clear-sighted fortune tellers, it was obvious that no quickly escalating international growth could take place until all necessary facilities were in place. And it turned out again that there was enough political drive um, and industrial competence to make this happen. Industrial sites were defined in Dusavik and Tananga. Building sites for erecting colossal platforms were located to Jotavogen. Rosenberg shipyard was reactivated. Housing areas were defined and houses for guest workers were built in an extraordinary speed. In the midst of this, it was a matter of course that all new citizens needed educational offers. 
ISS, same set of time, was the obvious solution. And this school, after a few years, had its own site here in the Reven area, as Garrett has talked about. The city council most often unanimously applauded this development, and Stavanger got a new school with a profile and a multitude of offers many Norwegian schools barely can beat. The school was important. The building of cultural institutions that took place during these uh, decades was equally important. The aim was and is to make people coming to Stavanger to, to feel satisfied. To add to this satisfaction, the airport has turned international on a whole new scale compared to previous decades. Many of us thought that the population in Stavanger uh, had reached a maximum around 1960 with 55,000 inhabitants and some 5,000 6,000 in the suburb city of Sannes. How wrong we were. The city of Stavanger is now a center of an urban area uh, counting about uh, 250,000 people, divided into eight to ten different formal communities, maybe a little more. I proposed in 1976 as a city councillor that Stavanger and Sannes should integrate into one political body. Good point. Um, Forty years have passed, uh, and this, strangely enough, has still not yet happened. A majority of local politicians in Norway seem to have forgotten that local government, when it was introduced 150 years ago, um, there were tools for the parliament to execute national policy in as efficient ways as, as possible. Now it seems to have turned the other way around. It should be obvious that in the same way that past small manufacturers and industrial enterprise have had to merge, it is concurrently a matter of course that this should have happened with small local administrative units as well. Regrettably, it seems that politicians in power never will let go voluntarily even when it serves the common good. So we have to wait for the parliament to decide to reduce this incredibly high number of small communities in Norway, in the same way as it happened in 1965, when this area was introduced to Stavanger City. Uh, at that time, 750 uh, Norwegian uh, communities were reduced to 450. So 300 mayors at the time disappeared and barely one single regret has been expressed later by anyone. Today, some commentators and media editors express doomsday prophecies due to the fact that the oil and gas sector experienced reductions uh, in the number of employees due, due to the con consequence of the falling oil prices on the global market. These comments need correction. The facts are that no large sector of society at any time can experience continuous growth over many decades without natural adaptations to the economic and political environment surrounding it. I trust that this will be um, put light upon uh, from the next speaker and that he will not disagree with me in thinking that the whole energy industry in Rogaland today will carry this city and this part of Norway forward towards continued expansion during the next 50 years. This, in my mind, will not only be due to the varied competence within the vast international industrial sector, but it will also be a consequence of Stavanger during the past 50 years having turned into a main regional center for all public and societal services, be it education, academic institution, health, culture, transport, research, tourism, and heritage preservation. This broad explanation about the feet on which Stavanger today solidly rests and growth upon, far too often seems to be forgotten by the commentators, narrowing the scope to oil and gas related activities only. In my mind, there seems to be no doubt that the numbers of employees within the public and semi-public services will increase continuously during the next decades. During the last 50 years, Stavanger has experienced a diversification in cultural activities 
that could not have been foreseen in 1960. Our new concert house and many musical activities and our symphony orchestra offer musical programs of high international standard. A large number of museums have emerged telling stories about our cultural history from the Stone Age up to the present. The offers today are so many and varied that people, children, as well as grown-ups can spend a lot of time on museum visits, not having to visit the same institution twice. The myriad of top restaurants in the city center serving splendidly prepared gastronomic niceties from almost any corner of the world represent a dramatically different situation from the sister city where I grew up, where you were not allowed to enjoy alcohol freely in bars and restaurants without having a meal uh, or staying at the hotel uh, where it was served. Stavanger 1950s. The Stavanger area during these last 50 years in the field of leisure activities have turned out, in my mind, to be one of the most attractive regions in Norway. Stavanger has a wonderful location in a landscape surrounded by fjords, islands, mountains, and beaches. A multitude of leisurely activities have developed. Some sport disciplines localized to stadiums for football, ice hockey, and handball, others to mountain climbing, cycling, skiing, hiking, windsurfing, sailing, and yachting. The building of winter resorts and summer cottages have exploded. The whole range of sound physical activity is to a great extent a result of the expansion the city has experienced over a short uh, span of time due to the industrial boom. ISS is a result of this boom and you have also the advantage of almost daily taking into use all the offers that have been created during the last two generations. Growth is a key word for the development of Rogaland and of Norway. Politically, these 50 years have been characterized by an increased degree of liberalization of attitudes. Politically, Norway has turned from a Labour Party-dominated society, that it was for decades, to a very diverse political landscape, an open democracy where anybody can take part very easily. We are proud of our democracy, based on principle of equality between all men and emphasizing the importance of freedom of speech and religion for all inhabitants. And we were proud when we last year celebrated the bicentennial for our democracy, uh, paying tribute to the other oldest democratic institutions, constitutions in France and in the United States. I remember clearly how the international school students and teachers took part in this celebration in our 17th of May parade. Our minds have turned from a fjord perspective to a world perspective. In 1957, the farthest... Switch up your mic. Connor, look at number three. Switch. Thank you. Let's go. Awesome. It works. It works. Do you want me to go back? Our perspective has changed, geographically. Um, in 1957, there are not so many here that uh, lived through that year. Um, I, I'll follow it. Um, I think it works. Um, the farthest I had been in 1957 was Nerbe. Uh, Nerbe. Egerson was too, felt to be too far away for a 14 year old boy, boy at that time. Uh, today, even my grandchildren have visited a number of foreign countries. Norway has been able to change from a nation a little by itself in the periphery of Europe 
to a wealthy co-player on the world stage. Our mentality needed change. It has changed. As you can see, Stavanger has experienced dramatic uh, change in how much of this has happened as a result of the activities of visionary men and women. But in spite of all changes from an old sleepy city to bustling modernity, the city has preserved some buildings and quarters that remind us of former times when all inhabitants spent their lives in wooden houses like those you find in Old Stavanger and some other parts of the downtown area. I think it was changed this way. Yeah. Um, and we value to preserve cultural, historic and monuments in order to integrate qualities from the past into the present and future city life. And finally, ISS has most obviously contributed to the changes both here in this community and in Norway as a whole. And the school has a good reputation thanks to the way the school has integrated into our society. Even if there may still be periods of changes in the industrial landscape and the population growth in the years ahead, you and all the nations you do represent is a guarantee for all of us that Stavanger will continue to be a main player in all industrial fields. This will serve Norway's competence and attractiveness. And you will be here with new leadership and new eager young faces to play the same important role 50 years from now. More than any other single school in our community, you connect individually and collectively with the international community. A happy birthday to all of you. Thank you, Hans Ivan, for your wonderful speech, for your reflections on the past and directions for the, for the future also within that. Um, I'm not a stagehand, but we'll give this a go straight into the microphone. Wow, look at this. Thank you. Well, I'll let Miss Landis do this because she's the theatre ham. Whilst, whilst she's taking care of that, I, I'd like now to uh, invite or I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Mr. Farouk al -Kassim. Just Google Mr. al -Kassim and you'll come up with over 45,000 results. One particular Time magazine article that I was interested in, in looking at gave a great, me great insight for the introduction for this evening. Farouk al -Kassim left a successful career in Basra with his family to move to Norway in order to receive health care they needed for their youngest son. On arriving in Norway, there was potentially little hope of finding a job as rewarding as the one that he'd left behind. At the time, he was not aware of the oil exploration that was underway on the Norwegian continental shelf, and even if he had known, he would not have been much cause for hope, because after five years of searching, there was still no oil to be found. Once in Oslo, Farouk al Qasim paid a visit to the Ministry of Industry just to see if anyone knew if any of the oil companies had work in Norway. Before long, he was put into the inner circle of the Norwegian government with officials mapping out the country's future as a major oil exporter. Commentators note that one of his most important early contributions was to persuade his Norwegian colleagues that actually the country had a future as an oil, producer, an oil exporter. Early in the early wells that had drilled that had come up, they had been empty, but Farouk al Qasim's analysis of the results convinced him that a big strike was in the offing. It came in December 1969 with the discovery of the gigantic undersea oil and gas fields known as Ecofisk. After that, Farouk al -Kassim was put in charge of mapping out how Norway would use its newly discovered resources. He did a remarkable job of marrying private sector competitiveness with government control, and commentators noted that Norway seems to have avoided the resource curse that has dragged down the economies of many nations with big hydrocarbon reserves. Farouk continues to be a private consultant uh, services to oil and gas sector and is also involved in teaching, education and training within the field. He is an author, amongst others, of a book called uh, World Bank about corruption in the oil business and he cooperates with other businesses in the field. He travels the world to share his knowledge, his experience about the Norwegian model for running an oil business 
so that it economically benefits the whole community and all its inhabitants. Farouk visited a school recently when he was one of our graduation speakers a few years back, and I know the graduating class still looked fondly on that. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Farouk al -Kassim. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations. Um, it is not perhaps a coincidence that oil activities in Norway and the establishment of the International School of Stavanger happened within almost one year. I think there is a link somewhere. When we look at the 1960s, the oil industry was going through a period of bitter confrontation. Large oil producing countries were pressing, pressing the international oil companies to renegotiate contracts that were signed at the beginning of the last century. They wanted more share in the decisions, and they also wanted a fairer share of the profit. The oil companies were, however, not in a mood to negotiate, and the confrontation continued. You would probably recall that the organization of the oil producing countries, the so-called OPEC, was established in the capital of my old country, Iraq, in Baghdad, in 1960. The objective of that organization was originally to strengthen their hand against the oil companies which had all the power and were not willing to negotiate. Unfortunately, confrontations continued until the mid-1970s when several of these producing countries finally decided that negotiation was not leading them anywhere, so they decided to nationalize their petroleum industry. And from that time on, national companies became the sole licensee in these countries, and these national companies own today something like 80% of the world reserves. So this is where we come from. In 1963, international oil companies showed very keen interest for oil exploration in the North Sea. The Norwegian society, almost without exception, was skeptical even to the presence of oil and gas. And no wonder, because the Norwegian Geological Survey had already proclaimed that there was absolutely no chance of finding petroleum, coal, or even sulfur. I don't know why they included sulfur, but they included it. The Norwegian government, however, was willing to let the international oil companies have a try. After all, why not? Their participation was essential for meeting the technological and operational challenges of the North Sea. And if you don't really realize that, the largest depth operated by oil companies at the time was 32 meters. And here we had to confront a lot more than 100 meters in very harsh conditions. So the tax regime was designed to assure licensees of a reasonably rapid cost recovery and an attractive return on investment. The dramatic hikes in the oil price in 1973 and again in 1979 resulted 
in enormous windfall profits, which were not foreseen. The taxation system was therefore adjusted so that the Norwegian government retained the major part of the profit. Since the nation decided in the early 70s to participate as a major shareholder in petroleum operations, the total government take was reached, has reached a very impressive and respectable 80%. And I think Norway is very much envied by many countries. The ECOFISC and the rapidly coming subsequent discoveries at the beginning of the 1970s established Norway as a major petroleum province and even the Norwegians, including the parliament, were in no doubt that Norway was here to stay as an oil nation. Thank God. The Norwegian parliament actually reached with admirable speed a very prudent decision. They decided that Norway needed a, a fundamental policy to stand on. This nation. The policy of gradual approach had certainly saved Norway from the negative impacts which could have come had we allowed things to go very quickly. At the same time, the approach gave the Norwegian industry time not only to catch up, but become part of the technology that mastered seas in the North Sea, but now over the whole world. Offshore goods and services are today a very major export item that enhances the Norwegian economy. Thanks for that wisdom. Has insisted on selecting its licensees in open competition. The selected oil companies had to work as partners in license groups where they supported each other and sup supplemented each other's efforts by positive exchange of experience and expertise as well as different views from different parts of the world. To encourage this win-win spirit between the licensees and the government, the state's Petroleum Administration, which was established in 1972, emphasized institutional integrity, fairness, professionalism, and full adherence to the legislation. And thank God the oil companies respected all that and appreciated. To encourage, sorry, an important feature, a very important feature, was the clear separation between the commercial interests of the state represented by Statoil and the regulatory and administrative administrative functions of the government represented, for example, by MPD and today uh, the PSA. The spectacular results achieved through this win-win relationship have made the world look up to Norway for guidance on how this can be achieved at all. Just to illustrate this, let me share with you some proud achievements. Norway has managed to achieve 48% recovery of the oil from the underground. This perhaps does not impress you, but the world average is below 30. Norway is truly and justly proud of this achievement. 
Today, Norway under the Oil for Development Program, OFU, is busy helping other nations learn from the Norwegian experience. I happen to be part of that process and I'm very proud of it. Hopefully, this will, con this will assist other nations to get more benefit out of their petroleum resources. What about the future? Cheap or easily producible oil is progressively becoming scarce. Production from non-conventional oil sources is increasing, but may show a temporary decline due to low prices. This is a threat to the global oil will continue to be the main source. Oscillations in oil price. The will continue just as they had done in the past. We never learn. In fact, lack of predictability in prices may become a major obstacle to developing high cost energy sources. Similarly, lack of predictability may disrupt the required growth in non-conventional oil production. Finally, although the cost of producing oil from the Norwegian continental shelf is likely to stay high, it is hoped that it will be able to compete with other non-conventional oil sources. So let's hope for a good future. Thank you. Thank you, Farouk. And I'd like to thank you also uh, for stepping in at uh, late notice this week when you, we phoned you on, uh, on, on Tuesday, I think it was. And so thank, thank you very much for, for coming this evening. Our third speaker is Roger Watkins. He graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Mathematics and holds a Master's degree in Aerospace uh, Science degree from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. After graduating from undergraduate pilot training uh, Advanced Air Force Base in Oklahoma, he has seen duty in a variety of flying and staff assignments, including air refueling and undergraduate pilot training. He also served as the political military planner and the deputy chief Iraq division of the Strategic Plans and Policy Directorate, joint staff at the Pentagon, Washington, DC. Brigadier General Watkins has commanded five times, including two wings at the Gene M. Holm Center for Officer Accession and Citizen Development at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. In addition, he has a broad military and civilian educational background, including Air, uh, Air Command and Staff College, Air War College, Senior Leader Development Program, University of North Carolina, and Harvard University, Massachusetts. Prior to his current assignment, General Watkins served as commander in the 379th uh, Air Expeditionary Wing in, uh, in Qatar. Sorry, something's dropped off here. Uh, we welcome you this evening. Thank you very much for that uh, very warm welcome and uh, greetings and uh, happy 50th anniversary to, to the ISS. Um, NATO and the Joint Warfare Center now, um, and it has been several previous uh, headquarters prior to being the Joint Warfare Center, ha have had a very strong relationship with the ISS over the years, and uh, I know that uh, we very much want to continue and grow that, uh, that strong relationship. The 15th of September of 1966, NATO, Europe, and the world um, was embroiled in the Cold War. NATO had been formed to combat and prevent 
military uh, transgressions by the Soviet Union and what evolved into the Warsaw Pact uh, as a response to NATO's inclusion of West Germany into NATO in the mid-50s. And so things were very, very tense in the world at that time. Furthermore, the United States was becoming more and more enmeshed in a war in Southeast Asia, with its contribution of troops having gone from a mere several hundred in the early 1960s to well over half a million troops at the height of the conflict in 1968. The world also saw conflict arise in the Middle East in 1967, the Six Day War, uh, when Israel um, was involved in conflict with Egypt and gained control of Gaza and the West Bank and Sinai. It was about that time that the Belgian foreign minister to NATO, Pierre Harmel, said, the future task of the alliance need to be to promote dialogue and detente. And it was at this time that NATO adopted a political track to help mitigate some of the alarming military developments that were taking place in the 1960s and 70s. The race to space that was initiated with the launch of Sputnik, Yuri Gregarin's uh, flight orbiting the Earth, and then um, Neil Armstrong taking the first steps on the moon and those famous words, that's one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind, were the types of developments that was stoking a nuclear arms race. This led to the strategic arms limitations talks between the United States and the Soviet Union and ultimately led to people would say uh, in defeat. And it began to change its foreign policy outlook and it became somewhat um, focused on the containment of global communism and the spread of communism, not only in Europe, but throughout the rest of the world. The other thing that occurred because of the United States' involvement in Southeast Asia was a lessening involvement in Europe and NATO. And so, that led to somewhat of a change of philosophy inside of NATO. And in 1978, the NATO countries officially defined the aims of the alliance were to maintain security and to promote detente. And so a series of initiatives began to take place. And the United States as well began to follow suit. In 1978, President Carter invited the leaders of Egypt and Israel to Camp David. And from that, uh, the, Arab, the Egyptian Israeli peace treaty came about. Sinai was returned to Egypt. And it began a thawing of relations in the Middle East. But all of that came to a halt in 1979 when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. In somewhat of a tit-for-tat move, the United States elected to boycott the 1980 Summer Olympic Games, and this led to the crumbling of this philosophy of detente. And in the 1980s, both the United States and its allies, as well as the Soviet Union, began massive military buildups. Uh, once again, um, leading the world to, to have somewhat of a disconcerted way. In fact, President Reagan, early in his presidency, gave a speech in which he declared the Soviet Union the evil empire and proposed the Strategic Defense Initiative, which was dubbed Star Wars. 
in honor of the famous movie now. Um, but what that did was promote uh, further development of not only nuclear weapons, but defenses against nuclear weapons. Uh, and this thought of mutually assured destruction, which was mad, um, became even greater uh, idiocy. I think we could all agree. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending upon where you sat in the world, all of this seeking of military capabilities was an extraordinarily expensive proposition. And the Soviet Union and its economy could not sustain it, and it began to crumble. In 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. In October of 1990, Germany reunified. In July of 1991, the Warsaw Pact dissolved. Later that year, the Soviet Union did not exist. And the world suddenly looked very different. Another strange thing happened as we had the change of decades into the 1990s. Communications and technology began to make cat or very, very uh, strong movements of development. How many people remember life without email? How many people remember life without an internet? All of that came about in the 1990s. And what it did is it began to connect the world with information and with communication. Another interesting thing began to happen. The Chinese, which had begun to develop their economy in the late 1970s, finally began to take traction. And the growth of their economy became explosive, and they became a real world power economically. And that changed the complexity of the global geopolitical environment. Many would say that was really the origins of what we call globalization today, economically. And this idea of a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week news cycle became a reality because of the explosive growth in technology and communications. It did not all equate to peace and tranquility, though. In the summer of 1990, Saddam Hussein decided to invade Kuwait. And there was a very strong military reaction uh, led by the United States. And a, a very violent but short war broke out, uh, which led to what is still today a 25-year military presence uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and not only that, conflict broke out in the Balkans, in Bosnia. And NATO had issues now again in its own backyard, thinking that they had escaped with the implosion of the Soviet Union, and now they were seeing ethnic violence at a level never before seen. In 1994 and 1995, NATO actually <coughs> began its first combat operations as a military alliance when they began operating uh, uh, air patrols over Bosnia and actually shot down uh, four Serbian jets. And the war continued to heat up when the United States F-16 was shot down which led to further calls for increased military action, which occurred. And unfortunately, in 1995, we had the Srebrenica massacre, which also moved the world to take further action. And the UN Secretary General 
authorized an escalation in the use of force. But the world had learned. And in Dayton, Ohio, the leaders of the world's largest countries, to include Russia, the United States, Yugoslavia, France, Germany, and the EU and the UK all came together and hashed out what came to be known as the Dayton Accords. And NATO transformed its combat mission into a peacekeeping mission of over 60,000 troops. Things in the Middle East also began to take a change. In 1993, President Clinton invited the Israelis and the leader of the Palestinian Authority to Camp David. And they too built on previous works of negotiation uh, to, to sign the Declaration of Principle in Washington, D.C., um, which gave autonomy to the Palestinian Authority to rule uh, Gaza and the West Bank. We also saw the first signs of what became known as the global terrorist movement in the 1990s as well. The first bombing of the World Trade Center, uh, military barracks inside several countries in the Middle East were bombed, as well as several embassies in Africa uh, were, were targeted and bombed. And it was also during this period in the 1990s that NATO had its first presence here in Stavanger with the establishment of NATO's headquarters north at the Yatta complex. In 1997, NATO experienced its first enlargement since 1955 when the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland joined NATO. And that began a very rapid uh, development of inclusion throughout Europe. And in 2000, NATO grew from 19 nations to its current size of 28 nations. However, the world continued to get more and more complex. <clears throat> in 1998, Pakistan tested its first nuclear weapon. In 2006, North Korea tested its first nuclear weapon. And in 2006, <clears throat> the Iranian nuclear program had begun to take such steps that the United Nations Security Council placed it under sanctions for violations of the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty. Of course, on September the 11th of 2001, our world changed again uh, with the attacks in the United States. And in October, the first ever declaration of Article 5, and that was mutual defense of a NATO country, was declared by the United States and confirmed by the North Atlantic Council, and NATO began operations in Afghanistan. As we all know, <coughs> the United States uh, continued military operations and invaded Iraq in 2003, um, which, which again polarized part of the geopolitical uh, environment that, that we now know. But NATO continued to grow and develop and in 2004 took over the International Stabilization Force mission in Afghanistan. And NATO began to administer the training and collective security in, in that country. And because of the success they had in Afghanistan, the Iraqi interim government invited NATO to come into Iraq uh, later that year. The world has continued to see <clears throat> extremism and the world has continued to come together to work for those things. In 2009, 
an Operation Ocean Shield was conducted to counter piracy in the Gulf of Aden and the Indian Ocean. And that has included warships from NATO nations, Russia, China, South Korea, it has truly been a global effort. At the turn of this last decade, the world began to see the Arab Spring. It began in Tunisia and spread rapidly throughout North Africa and parts of the Middle East. We saw a democratically elected government in Egypt, which was then overthrown. And then we saw a civil war break out in Libya, and NATO intervened there as well under the auspices of a UN Security Council resolution establishing a no-fly zone, and those operations ultimately brought about Colonel Gaddafi's overthrow. Along about the same time, civil war broke out in Syria. And there has obviously been a four and a half year civil war um, that is still ongoing today and has led to the refugee crisis that Europe is now experiencing. In 2012, the Joint Warfare Center completed its renovations and added a brand new facility and added a capability here in Stavanger that, uh, that I think has solidified NATO's presence in Norway. And what that gave the Joint Warfare Center as its primary training uh, entity for NATO is the capability to train the headquarters that, uh, that, that form the NATO military command structure. Also a significant development in 2014 was the appointment of Mr. Jan Stoltenberg as the Secretary General of NATO. And I think that this has been a very, very positive development uh, as he is the first Secretary General from, from Norway uh, in NATO. Uh, and it has also strengthened, I think, the resolve uh, here for the support of the Joint Warfare Center. I'll just wrap up and conclude by saying that the past 50 years have been a very extraordinary period of time in our world. It has seen much conflict and it has seen much peacemaking and peace building and had successes and failures. And I think much like the development of the ISS and its predecessor uh, before, that, that there is, is enormous um, uncertainty going into the future from a geopolitical strategic perspective. But I do know that one thing remains certain uh, about the international school and education. It is through education that we will make this world a better and safer place because education is the great equalizer because when people have their minds developed and expanded, they can see the, fu <coughs> excuse me, the futility that, that conflict and war brings to our world. And so I wish the ISS much luck and continue to educate the youth of our world and the 50 nations that your school currently serves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brigadier General Watkins. Wow, 50 years school, Stavanger, the oil industry, geopolitical situation. I think we're now all ready for some cake <laughs> um, and some snacks and something to drink in the cafeteria. We'll have a break for about 15 minutes or so. And the rest of these good people will get a little bit more nervous because they're on for five minute slots, 10 slides in the second half. 
So if you'd like to join us all just in the cafeteria for, uh, for, for some drinks and some snacks. Thank you. Okay, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your, uh, your snacks out there. And uh, I hope you're ready for something new because as Gareth said before, we're, uh, we're going to try something new here. Everybody that's speaking in the next half, in the second half, the third half, uh, I'll get five minutes and the slides will automatically advance every 30 seconds, all right? So it is a bit of a wild ride and I'm sure we've all tried to rehearse, but be patient with us. Um, so I'm David Beatty, I'm the Director of Technology here at the International School of Stavanger. Um, I've been in international education since 1998, worked in Kenya, Qatar, India, and a little bit in the US. Um, and it's my job here to take us to the second half. So we've been talking about the last 50 years, and now I'm gonna talk about the next 50 years, but I'm actually gonna start in the past. And so I'm sort of the guy that is the go-between that's taking us from the past to the future, all right? Um, so, I'm looking at my guys, uh, thinking, I'm, thinking that they're gonna get everything up there, ready to go. All right, yep, part two, the next 50 years. <laughs> they're looking for my thumbs up. So you guys can give a, you can give a thumbs up when you're ready. Yep, that's me. Okay, so this is around 1980. This is my first computer. It was a Radio Shack TRS-80. Anybody have one of those? Yeah, a few hands. My brother and I used to spend hours and hours, days, programming in BASIC on this thing. We used to copy the code out of a book, and then my sister one time walked by, and the plug came out, and we lost everything, all right? <laughs> so it was a terrible experience, but it was really, really fun. We used to, then we got a cassette deck, because you could save your stuff to a cassette tape. I see a shaking head over there. So yeah, and then, uh, so speaking of cassettes, <laughs> um, I showed this picture to my daughter the other day. She didn't know what that thing was on the left. <laughs> um, a lot of kids, you know, maybe high school, college, they're familiar with a cassette tape, you know, like their parents or grandparents have one. And they know what a pencil is, but do they know how the two work together? Anybody know? <laughs> yes, oh, lots of hands, very good. <laughs> lots, of, lots of wisdom in this room, so. This is just to give you an example of how things change. So this used to be technology. You could like skip songs with it, and if you ran out of batteries. Okay, so telecommunications is a great example of change. So the, the payphone and, and regular landlines used to be very popular. Uh, this is Marty Cooper with one of the, he, he worked for Motorola. He developed the first cell phone. Um, looks really nice and portable, doesn't it? It used to make phone calls. And then we moved up to the Motorola Razor, which was an amazing thin phone, but it essentially basically just made phone calls and maybe a little bit of texting on that. And now, of course, there's a computer that sits in your pocket that you can access the internet and that sort of thing. There are 44 varieties of Colgate toothpaste. Okay, Simon Sinek talks about this in his book, Starting With Why. Uh, this is just an example to show you that there is an endless variety of things that are being developed. The, the rate from prototype to, produ to production is getting faster and faster. So it's just easier and easier to make new technology, new software, um, develop cars, uh, all sorts of different things that are out there. So this is my example to show you how, how many things we're going to see in the future. All right. Big data. Big data is going to get even bigger. All right. So uh, it's, there's some researchers that say that Google can predict election results now because they have enough information from the searches around the world in different areas that they can say, from these search results, we think so-and-so is going to win this election. Um, think about health data that you can now collect on your phone and you can share with people and think about how in the future that type of data can be used to, uh, to further research and education. All right, not just a bunch of data, but it moves really fast. Have you seen Sweet Brown? Yep. She did an interview on the news. One day later, it was uploaded to YouTube. Two days later, someone had made a, a remix video, a meme sort of developed out of this as well. It went viral. It had 15 million views, all right? And that was just sort of the main YouTube video. Uh, but 15 million views, so it just, things move so fast within 48 hours, within three days. Describes her horrifying and you get to be 15 million plus 100. The complex was on fire. Well, I woke up to go give me a cold pop. Then I thought somebody was barbecuing. I said, oh Lord Jesus, it's a fire. And then the smoke got me, I got bronchitis. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. 
You can also, you can buy that app, or you can buy an app, and there's the song on iTunes as well. All right. So, tons of variety, tons of data. It's moving really fast, like that video, and it's going to be everywhere. These students are in rural Kenya, and they're using something called a brick that a friend of mine works with an organization to help develop. It uses simple things, cellular data, to bring the internet to locations where kids don't have access to the internet. So there's this little brick. It'll last for several days on a battery, and it, and it basically rebroadcasts the internet over Wi-Fi um, in a remote location, all right? So right now, research tells us that within the next seven to eight years, so by 2022, 99% of the world will have access to the internet. Now, they might not have a device to connect, but they will be covered by mobile data. So imagine how that changes. Think about this little girl here that's accessing the internet from this rural place in, in Kenya, uh, where I actually lived for four years. But just imagine now, this child has the same access to information that we have access to at the International School of Stavanger. So imagine how that's gonna change. So tons of data. It's gonna move really, really fast. It's gonna be everywhere in the world. What's left for us as schools and as educators it's the rest, it's the human element, it's character, respect, integrity, empathy. Those are things that you can't learn just from a Google search, that you can't learn just from you know, picking up data and, and doing research on, and just crunching numbers, so to speak. Um, it's really up to us, the, the educators and the students and the school community to bring in that human element. Thanks. So we're also going to switch up the second half a little bit and we're going to ask Carol Wallace to come forward and to, she's going to introduce all the speakers from the, the second half, so Carol. Good evening everybody, my name is Carol Wallace, as Gareth said, and I'm the middle school principal, mm -hmm. and this is about default. Um, I've been here at ISS since 1996, can't believe it myself, yes. So I'm delighted to be able to get to introduce some people and some former students, first one up. We're delighted to welcome Thomas Townsend back to ISS tonight. Thomas graduated from ISS in 2013, having been at ISS from fifth grade. A leader in his class, he is now currently studying computer science at Cardiff University and working as a junior software developer um, on the Reservoir Management Software RMS program for Roxar Software Solutions in his year in industry. When at ISS, Thomas was heavily involved with innovative technology initiatives, in particular, and for example, leading the ISS iPad help desk. Thomas is doing some game-changing work by day, and tonight will preview the future of oil industry technology. Welcome back, Thomas. Uh, good evening. So, yeah, tonight I'll be talking about the future of uh, technology in the oil industry. Right, so I'm not an engineer. I'm a software developer, so I'll be talking about this from a software perspective. But that also means I can talk about how any evolutions in software technology can also come back to the consumer life, which we all seem to love with memes and all that good stuff. Um, and just as a note of warning, predicting the future is always risky and almost never right, so don't hold me to this. Um, so to improve technology, you always need to look at the past or what you have at the moment to find the problems and then solve the solution. So this is our RMS software uh, product. It's at the moment one of the world's leading geological modeling software and simulation programs, and it costs tens of thousands of dollars and requires extremely expensive computers to run, but it enables the oil industry to find and recover oil at breakneck speeds. But then you have something like this, which I've been working on for the last two weeks, which now uses cutting edge web technologies, and we can achieve the same performance on any device. This is our 3D viewer, but working in Chrome, and you can run this on any phone, tablet, or PC and look at all of RMS's models, horizons, and wells in 3D in perfect 60 frames per second. 
So where do we look for the inspiration for tomorrow's technology? Sci-fi has always been the, uh, one of the driving powers in uh, software or in technological advancement. One example of this is the, uh, the, uh, the flip phone, which came from uh, the Star Trek original series. But many other technological advancements include the submarine, helicopter, and even rockets. So what sci-fi can we take to look for the future now? One that I like is uh, the Iron Man movie, the whole idea of Tony Stark's Jarvis and all his holographic and cool stuff he has in his garage. And even now, this is becoming a reality with uh, Microsoft's recently announced HoloLens, which is the idea of wearing a visor that puts a 3D model in your own view rather than... So you could... So, for example, that model there was... there. <laughs> this is a bit too fast. <laughs> so pervasive computing is now what's coming into the new world. It's the called the third era of technology. So you had the first one with mainframes. You had to log on to this big remote computer. Then you had a one-to-one, -one, so everyone having their own PC. And now uh, the third era, which is everyone having multiple devices. And pervasive computing is the idea of how all of these devices can communicate, to communicate together and gather data to improve your own life. And at the heart of this is artificial intelligence. Now, art artificial intelligence is like a child. You just pray, program something which can learn, but you don't give it anything else. You then teach it data, and from that, it can learn. So it's seen m many images that have been tagged, and then from that, it can look at these images and find all the items that have been highlighted there, all on its own. And at no point did we teach it how to recognize something in an image. And this is something that's also in our daily lives with virtual assistants, such as Siri, Google Now, and Cortana. So they gather information from a multitude of sources, such, like, such as uh, your email, uh, your health, through Pulse, your location, and they can give you information without you even asking for it. And so this is a very exciting and developing uh, prospect. So where can we get the next in inspiration for the future of technology? With, but let's take both of these as an example. So my envision for RMS is you, rather than having the renderer be on the screen, you have in holographic in front of you. This enables never seen before or able before natural interaction with a model. And say, for example, also artificial intelligence. This could enable you to, say, be in a meeting. You're talking with your boss about some model. And the artificial intelligence has picked up on this and has triggered a simulation in your, in your desk. So when you come back, it's already running there for you. But these enhancements aren't just for oil. They can be applied to any number of enterprise or no, uh, solution, but also for consumers. I mean, who wouldn't want Tony Stark's Jarvis in their basement and all his holographic awesomeness? So this is just a brief preview of the, what could happen in the next 50 years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Next up, Gary Hargreaves has connected to the International School of Stavanger for a number of years. His two sons are both in the primary school, and Gary diligently serves on the school's board of trustees. One of our many NATO parents, Gary heads the Organizational Development Planning Division for NATO Joint Warfare Center. In our leadership role, Gary tunes into the needs of a complete organization on a daily basis. It is our privilege to welcome him to the stage to talk about the changing role of leadership in the future. Welcome, Gary. Thank you, and uh, good evening. I think I'm about ready. Okay, um, I'm going to talk to you about leadership, and if you need any clues how about it's going to, if it's going to change or not, who is going to lead Thomas in the next 50 years? That's going to drive change. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to talk about leadership more as an art form, something intuitive and express, inexpressive, uh, and the domain is going to change because of all this dynamism that is currently ongoing. Colin Powell likes to call it art. 
And I think I would agree with that. So what we're really talking about is a relentless exponential drive in technology. It's one of the major drivers for changing leadership. Machines are already better able to do some of the things that we do. For instance, surgery, driving cars, flying planes, processing, analyzing, and making decisions. It is said that by 2025, artificial intelligence robots will be on company boards. It's going to be a game changer. What else will change? Well, leaders are going to be much, much harder to identify based on age, clothes, gender, or race. It's going to be increasingly uncomfortable for a whole lot of mid-range leaders who are having the rug pulled out from under them. They've been working their way up the ladder to the bigger office and more perks, and they're going to find they're not there. It's going to become much more egalitarian, uh, egalitarianism and more network and shared, and heroic traits will disappear. Having gone down a certain path before will be no guarantee of success. In fact, what people like Thomas definitely do not want to hear is that's the way we've always done it around here. They want to hear, can you go out there and find me a way to do this better? Leaders will have to stop thinking at the source of answers and start to believe that they're the source of questions. So they're going to have to let go. They're going to have to let go of thinking that they're the omniscient chess player able to control the movements of every piece and instead create conditions where the pieces can think for themselves, where they can communicate together and where they have the freedom and autonomy to act. There's going to be a big shift in, in focus from what an organization does to why it even exists. A clear and powerful alignment about purpose. Organizations need to start to stop pulling and realizing why they're pulling at all and starting to pull together. Leaders must be crystal clear about the why, the purpose, and align an organization through strategy, through structure, and culture. And if anybody doesn't think that culture eats strategy and structure for breakfast, pop on the news or Google Volkswagen and you'll find that the killers aren't always the strategy or the structure, it's the, it's the culture. Leaders are going to have to start being even more intentional about making connections. Connections that will span time zones and cultures and connections that will replace hierarchical modes of leadership with multi-way collaborative modes of leadership. C2, or command and control, something we're familiar with, may well be rebadged and start to have to become understood as communicate and collaborate. The bridge will be the way. So as we've heard, leadership is in a very, very volatile, complex and ambiguous place. Information is unavoidable, it's instant, it craves our attention and demands intervention. And machines are better at dealing with it than we are. So does that mean that leadership can abdicate its responsibilities? Absolutely not. There is no technological answer yet and none foreseen for negotiation, for compromise, for inspiring people and teams so that they can achieve more than the science says is possible. Leaders are going to have to know and start to feel where they actually need to apply their art. They're going to have to develop their sense of intuition far more than their cognitive ability to make sense out of the data. Knowing and sense-making will, will be down to listening to themselves inside, to their inner voice, and paying attention to their gut. In my view, then, the top three uh, things that the leaderships of the future, why it will look different, leaders are going to have to be artists in organization alignment, in getting the whole organization top to bottom, to understand why it exists. They're going to have to be relentless in connecting people and empowering people. And they're going to have to call upon uh, their intuitive mind and unleash its potential throughout an organization. That's how I think leadership will change in the next 50 years. Thank you. Next up, we have a short video from our early childhood and primary school students who were asked to preview what the future will look like with regard to inventions. 
and this needs no more introduction than that. Enjoy. We think that people shouldn't invent the copy of the future. It like copies yourself and it makes a drone of yourself. You can put how many hours, minutes, days, years, how long it has to go on for, and months. And well, so it's a it's a box that. Like you type in whatever you want and how many you want and then you press go and then it sends it to you in like five seconds. Mine's a locker that has everything in it for you when you open it. My invention for the future is a camera that refuses to take bad pictures. So if the composition is right or it's like a toaster and then you can like put a picture into it and then put a picture onto the bread. A magic pencil that can turn into whatever you want. A magic pencil that can turn into whatever you want. What would you want it to turn into right now? A pony. No, I don't. A dinosaur. <laughs> I need to dig a Wi-Fi chip, so it's really small and you can take it wherever you want and then... My idea is whenever you wanted something or you wanted to buy something, you, your robot would get it for you. And if it was... For a football pitch, if you kick the ball away, there's machines that the ball will land in the machine and it just sucks it up and throws it right back onto the pitch. So it's safe. So, my idea is a marble wizard, so if you want to play a game of marble, just snap your fingers, then pop, you are your marble. There's some more of them coming later. Atashi Chatterjee is our next presenter. Atashi and her sixth sister came to ISS from India several years ago. Atashi started at ISS in sixth grade. Now in ninth grade in high school, Atashi is a dedicated student and someone who actively participates in many of the sports, arts and music offerings here at school. For her presentation, she wondered what sports and arts would or could look like in the future. Welcome to Atashi. Good evening, and welcome to my idea of how the future will look like. As you, I can see, you are all extremely eager to start. So today I'll present the futuristic destiny of sports and arts in my eyes. Now think of a very common word, food. Uh, yes, always on my mind, but no, technology. Think of technology in both sports and arts. Bear with me, hopefully tomorrow's technology will be able to change them by will. Let's start with, let's start with tech and sports. As a swimmer, I would definitely want those goggles. See your speed in the left side and how many calories you burn in the right side. And the second picture, <laughs> honestly, I don't know what it does, but it looks like it has something to do with technology and sports. Yeah, don't you think so? <laughs> On the same topic, look at that chair. Normal, right? Well, what if it had the same effects as doing exercise would? So going from an unhealthy couch potato to a healthy couch potato, couch potato fitness, am I right? So goodbye to all those exhausting fitness tests during PE, I hope. <laughs> Sorry, awkward silence. Going on to the tech and art. Imagine having that pen. The ink color will switch to whatever you scan. Scan an apple, a red pen. Scan a leaf, a green. 
No more need to find the exact shade of everything. Just scan. And I know some of you artists out there may be looking like the bottom two pictures right now. Um, and I'm no big artist, but I know how you feel. As I said, I know how you feel. <laughs> um, but you know, all these hypotheses may not come true. Who knows what the future may hold? Who knows what our world will look like? The picture, maybe? Maybe not. Again, who knows? But for now, all we can do is, wait for it, wait for it. Still waiting, dream. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well done, Atashi. We are delighted to have the Deputy Mayor of Sula join us for this special 50th celebration. Jan Sigve Kjelte and Mayor Ola Uland have been friends of the school and a number of Sula families over recent years. You may have heard that Sula Kommune recently took the top spot in all of Norway for the National Health Organization municipality rankings. Their office is dedicated to healthcare issues, and tonight his focus will be on the changing nature of healthcare and medical technology. Welcome, Young Sigma. Before, before we start, it's um, a kind of different for me as a politician not to um, have, have um, control of what I, I'm going to say. Um, but but, but uh, I think th this is a, a good op opportunity, so you, you can start. And uh, I'm honored to be here uh, to say something. We heard, heard about 50 years ago. This is me 50 years ago. Um, uh, the, um, the war in Vietnam was going on. Um, Neil Armstrong took a big step for mankind. Rolling Stones was a world tour in Norway. And I started school. Uh, 50 years later, uh, something changed. Um, it's the same place. <laughs> the picture is taken yesterday. Um, and it, something has happened. We have grown bigger, and perhaps we have grown smarter. Um, how will it be in 50 years? To predict that, we can go to facts, science facts, not science fiction. Uh, we are all familiar with the movie, I think, I hope we are all familiar with the movie Back to the Future. Um, he skates, um, Marty McFly skates on a hoverboard in 2015. Many have tried to predict the future. Um, uh, George Orwell wrote the book in 1948, describes the situation in 1984, of surveillance of society, it played a key role. What's the facts today? We leave a cell phone, everything traces, get, we leave traces. <laughs> we have not got hoverboard in uh, 2015, but you have really got slim televisions. Unfortunately, we get a little bit thicker. What's happening with our health? The Western world have never spent more money on healthcare. The last year, 50 years, we have found a vaccine or cure for many diseases. Um, what do we know about the future? Is that the elderly population will grow. We do know that technology will de develop like we can't imagine. In the year 2050, one third of the European population will be over 60 years. As soon as 2035, the number of people over 80. We will also probably need more immigration. Angela Merkel understands it. Is the Syrian, is the Syrian refugees a problem for Norway? Norwegian children looks more or less like this when they start at school. 
They're already familiar with information technology. Scientists estimate that one of five that start school today end up in a profession that does not exist now. Do you know what Bill Gates predicted in 1981? Nobody will ever need a computer with more memory than 637 kilobytes. In the future, we have to cooperate with the technique. We can today enable houses to um, build houses to enable people to stay longer at home. Smarter houses, you can control your living space throughout an iPad. Orwell described about surveillance society that nobody wants. Big Brother does see you today, but is it a problem? Um, I believe that we are depending on welfare technology to meet the challenge ahead. My tip for the future is stay in school, you will live longer. Stay fit, you will live long, home longer, and welcome technology. It can make your life a bit, little bit easier. Thank you. Thank you. In addition to Jan Sigve, we have another elected representative from the Sula Municipal Council, and she is a 2015 ISS graduate. <laughs> Manur Raja had been at ISS for 15 years, from preschool to 12th grade. She was recently elected as the youngest member to the Sula Council. No matter her age, Manur was always actively involved in school activities, arts, and importantly, service works. She's a budding artist who on the side runs her own t-shirt brand, Mara Inc, that helps to save elephants. She is committed to doing good. Her website says, be part of the change. Be part of something small, be part of something big. Just be a part, and I can assure you, you will want to do more. Manor will highlight the importance of giving back over the next half century. Welcome back, Manor. Right, we'll see how this goes. But luckily, none of my slides have to sync with the... Uh... Bold. Yes, I know. The world is turning mad. And I'm not afraid of saying that. That's the thing. I'm not afraid. And there are so many others who are neither afraid because of this one tool we did not have 50 years ago. Social media has placed this gigantic world into one little device sitting in your pockets right now. If there was an attack from Pakistan to India, we would know about it immediately. We would not have to sit and wait for the radio. We would not have to sit and wait overnight for the newspaper to come out the day after. The same idea goes for giving back. Right now, we're facing the largest humanitarian crisis since the Second World War. Syrians are fleeing their country. Europe is not prepared. Politicians were talking while people were taking action. One picture of this little boy washed up on shore caught the world's attention. I decided not to show him today. Um, but there were talks of sending refugees back until this little boy Syrian boy, Ailan, stole the hearts of the people. People all over the world have created groups on Facebook. For example, the Norwegian group Welcome Refugees, or Dropenihave, which translates to a drop in the ocean, to organize donations by the local people. We no longer think of this world as too big. We think of this world as small, Crises are not far away anymore, they're close. We have a feeling of duty to respond to them, and it's becoming more and more obvious that we want to help. There are less and less people saying, I don't know how to help, and more people saying, I know how to help, join this charity, join this organization, see what you can do. 
But I'm not saying giving back is about taking drastic actions in your life. That was just one example of how the world is cooperating and not caring about borders anymore. We are not afraid of taking new steps in life, but we are concerned. Concerned if it is worth the time to spend a few hours a month visiting the elderly homes because we are unaware. Concerned if sending our children to collect money for charity will take up valuable homework time. Everyone listening right now is going to become old, hopefully, and know someone who is old. How would you like them to be treated or yourself? Not only with respect, I assume, but with love and care and conversation. You need to stop thinking about concerns and start dealing with them. Experience what it is like to spend a few minutes with the elderly in your communities and see how much they will appreciate it. Organize and schedule for your children to do their homework so they don't lose valuable time. The future of giving back is looking bright. It used to be governments who mainly did the giving back, distributing funds, but people are contributing as well. Educational programs such as the IB have incorporated CAS in order for students to not only focus on their studies, but become part of the community. Creativity, action, and service. Imagine if this was implemented into all educational programs across the world. The amount of young people experiencing the feeling of giving back and taking an active part in the local community will become vital for them to grow as global citizens and for them to grow as people who care. I forgot to introduce myself, but my name is Manor Raja, and I graduated from ISS after spending 15 years, as Ms. Wolf was saying. I started my own t-shirt business called Mara Inc., where the profits go to charity at the age of 16. I was student council president in middle school and in high school, and I represented ISS in the Youth City Council of Stavanger for two years, one being a board member. I had 10,000 kroners donated to the Cameroon Service Project, started by students here at ISS. 15,000 kroners went to the World Wildlife Fund for Mara Inc., and with the help of ISS class of 2015, we managed to raise 25,000 kroner for the Norwegian Cancer Association. And this is all thanks to ISS learning about giving back, having CAS in their programs. <sighs> it would be a lie if I said I didn't do these accomplishments for myself, because I did. I did it because it made me feel good. And I can assure you, it will make you feel amazing. Don't be afraid, and don't be afraid of sharing it on social medias. Maybe it will inspire someone to do the same. I'd like to end this speech with one of my favorite quotes. If you wait until you can do everything for everybody, instead of something for somebody, you'll end up doing nothing for nobody by Michael Baines. Thank you. Aren't you just extremely impressed with our ISS students? <laughs> You're now going to hear from some more, more, slightly younger ones, with some more video extracts of the future. It's going to be in the future, the car is going to fly. Some bricks will start falling down off the school. And there, they'll make vacuum cleaners that go in the water and suck up all the trash that the people drop in the ocean so the creatures don't get sick. In the computer lab, I think there's going to be new apps and games. What's going to happen when the school is a hundred years old? I think it's going to be a doghouse. A hospital. <laughs> and we take care of everyone? I think it's going to be smashed down. Smashed down? And are they going to build a new one? I think they're going to build 
A building. What's it going to look like? I think it's going to be a snake house. <coughs> it's going to be a castle. In the cafeteria, I think when you sit down, maybe the, maybe the TV will pop up in front of you. Dinosaurs are going to come back alive. Hover bikes? And how will the students use the hover bikes? There's like pedals that you um, that you sort of use like a bike, but then the propeller, there's like four propellers and they start to spin. And then you start to float. Uh. Okay, okay, okay. Everybody's going to turn into aliens and scientists are going to make a potion that, pull, that pulls on the ground and then it spreads and makes, and when people sit on the floor, it makes them into aliens. Um, I'm going to think that there will be a new school with new teachers, and there will be water slides inside, and the hallway will actually be a icony, and you can swim to your classroom. The invention um, is at school, the teacher. Um, there's a robot teacher that would hand out candy every day. That sounds like wishful thinking. Some people are going to have robotic legs, and also the, the school is going to have a giant, the school is going to have a giant orb on it, like, I think all the doors are just going to be holograms. Instead of a marker, you draw on the board a chalk. And then the desks will be on like a one row, and then the teacher will write it on trucks on the trucks on the board. Oh, I think the bus is turned into the magic school bus. I wonder how many of them will actually come true. I'd like the water slides inside. <laughs> to wrap up the second half speakers, Paul Sewell will take the stage. Paul is no stranger to ISS. For the last few years, he and Gary Hargreaves have led professional development sessions at ISS that help to build organizational culture and healthy employee mindsets. Paul is a lessons learned analyst and lead facilitator of organizational culture for NATO. He is the one who manages the design and analysis of lessons learned in NATO's operational exercises to improve future operations. In this role, there is a constant reliance on new ways of thinking and new ways of innovating. For the next 50 years, Paul says we'll need to take a more active role in how we innovate and let our ideas jump the fence. Welcome, Paul. Okay, I'm 42 years old. I think I'm going to be here in 50 years for that snake house. All right, so I'm waiting up for that. Okay, thank you. In 1968, Dr. Spencer Silver worked for 3M, a big company in the US. And his job was to make a glue that was for aircraft parts, so super strong. Now, unfortunately, the glue he made wasn't even strong enough to hold together two pieces of paper. So he went to the board and he told them about the project, and they said it was a failure. Kill the program. But he thought it still had value, so he persisted. So instead of calling it a failure, he had a bit of a change. He called it a solution without a problem. I really like that. He knew it had value. Now, luckily, a few years later, uh, Art Fry, who also worked at Triple at 3M, had a hymn book. And he wanted to make a bookmark that would stick to the page but not tear it. So he actually found that this glue was extremely helpful. So he kept developing it, and he developed one of the most profitable lines in 3M. Does anybody know what that is? There we go. Look at that, the post-it note. Within this very building, there's probably thousands of them, right? Can you imagine where we would be if he had accepted that no from the board? More importantly, how many ideas are we saying no to every day? The next big transformation, how many of those have we snuffed out? 
censored ourselves or censors other people's ideas. But why does that happen? Well, I like to call it the Wiley Coyote Doctrine. You remember this guy? I used to love this as a kid. You know, Wiley Coyote had always these great inventions, right? Wanting to swoop down and take the, uh, the roadrunner. And he always failed. And what annoyed me so much was he never tried the same thing again. Just one more, just do it one more time. That's probably why I'm a lessons learned analyst, right? <laughs> but we do this all the time as well. We're always cutting down our ideas. And that needs to change. Because ladies and gentlemen, what got us here today from 50 years ago will not take us to where we need to be in 50 years from now. We need to think differently. We need to innovate, but not just wait for these kind of aha PowerPoint kind of post-it note moments. We need to actually manufacture our innovation and creativity. So how do we do that? That's a long 30 seconds. Yes, that's what we need to do. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to let our ideas jump the fence and flourish in other fields. What do I mean by that? We need to take an idea from one area, mash it up with different areas, because that's where the real heart of innovation is. And that's something we need to do in a more kind of controlled, systematic way, rather than waiting for that kind of eureka moment. So I want to give you a great example now. What we have here is what's called a mind kafon. Now, this started off as an Afghani student who grew up in Afghanistan. Do you know what tumbleweeds are? You see them in all the westerns? Well, what he did, he made an art project to make a big one. It's about two meters high, right? But what he's now used that for is for mine clearance. So this is, costs about 40 euros. It's made out of bamboo and synthetic rubber. And that rolls over dangerous areas, saving hundreds of lives, thousands if not lives. That's just one example. So before I leave, I have two challenges for you. The long-term challenge is this. Say yes more often to new ideas, yours and others. Because an idea needs nurturing, right? It won't be mature after the first jump. We need to say yes. We need to let it develop. Because a good idea can become a bad idea, can become the next big idea that changes everything. So that's the long term. But the short term, and this is for every one of you in this room here, for the next seven days, I want you to think, take two different concepts that don't belong together and mash them together and see what comes up. Now, be aware, you need to persist because, every, because creativity is like a muscle, right? The more you work it, the better it gets. And I guarantee if you persist over the next seven days, you may be kind of interested in what you come up with. So this is not just for the students. This is all, they're all crumbly people like me too. Ladies and gentlemen, what, what really kind of pumps me up about innovation is the next big idea for Stavanger, for Norway, for the world could come from anyone in this room. Think about that. You could be having a shower, be doing the gardening, and two ideas that never belonged together before come together. And you're the first person to have that thought. But for ladies and gentlemen, for that to happen, we have to think and remember the lesson of the poster note and make it stick. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And I think, I think we did that last year when we decided to mix two things together which hadn't been done before, which was a more traditional reflection of the past and the more five-minute views of the future for this opening event. So it was bringing two ideas together, which perhaps traditionally we haven't done, done here at ISS. I'd like to just finish very, very briefly uh, by closing by thanking uh, all our participants this evening and, and for their, their, their wise words, their kind words, their ideas, their creative ideas, their reflections. I think we've all learned something this evening uh, uh, from, from listening to, to our speakers. I'd like to thank the people who have actually helped to put this together. There's a lot of people behind the scenes that have enabled this to, to, to happen this evening, uh, all the way from the, from the cafeteria staff, the cleaning staff in school here, to just make sure that we, we were able to, to participate here. We're actually really amazed that nearly 200 people turned up on a Friday night for school for this open event. So what was really, uh, I think, nice is, is that this notion of community that we talk about in school extends 
further than, than just that personal interaction of a one-to-one, -one, of the please and thank yous that we have in the classrooms, of the doors that are opening, the kindness that shows on, on an everyday basis, but that, that, that you as a group will come out and support the school, okay in its 50th year as we go through, but to be able to share these ideas, the reflections that we've had about Stavanger, the juxtaposition between the past and the future, and if anybody knows me well, I think the present is very important too. And that's been really interesting to sit here tonight whilst you're thinking about things about what you've got to organize, just to remind yourself to be in the present, to be in the present when you're listening to people, to be in the present when you're thinking about ideas for the future, that you're present with them. And to, I think on David's slide, to be, to be very present in the notion of things like curiosity, kindness, thoughtfulness, manure, in terms of giving, that we're very conscious in the present moment that we're able to do that. And I think we've seen examples of people in the broader community who have brought that. We've seen examples of current students who have done that, examples of past students who have done that. So I'm not going to say anything more than thank you very, very much for, for coming this evening. There'll be a number of events that we have over the course of the rest of this academic year uh, celebrating the, the, the school's history and looking forward to the future. We will be inviting you to all of them. We hope that you will uh, come and attend those with us as part of our school community. Thank you.